Um, going back to Oswald, why explain to people who aren't familiar with it, what was his involvement specifically with the CIA in New Orleans? Obviously, we know he, he was working in Japan for the Marines, doing surveillance flights over China. And that was... Well, actually, it's even worse than that. Okay. Okay, because one of the things... This was one of the things I wanted to put in the film. Okay. When the House Select Committee of Assassinations convened, they assigned a woman named Betsy Wolf to the Oswald file at the CIA. She requested charters from every division of the Central Intelligence Agency. I think there's something like nine, okay? She read through all the charters. Then, from that information, she put a little graph on the wall saying, okay, then this is what Oswald's files should have done within the CIA. So then she saw the file. And guess what? It didn't do anything like that. Okay, it didn't go through what the, what she thought it would have done, which was the Soviet Russian division. Okay, because when Oswald leaves the Marines, he defects to the Soviet Union. So he thought, she thought, well, that's where his file should go, is the SR division. They didn't go there at all, period. So she started interviewing people within the CIA, trying to figure out what the heck happened to Oswald's file. All right. And so finally, in the autumn of 1978, she interviews a guy named Richard Gambino, who at that time is the chief of the Office of Security, which, by the way, that's where Oswald's file went. It went to the Office of Security, all right? And he tells her, look, it doesn't matter how many documents come in, and it doesn't matter if they're pre-stamped. Okay, to go somewhere. If you intervene at the first gate, which is called the Office of Mail Logistics, that is where those documents will go to. So here she finally, in November of 1978, she has the Eureka moment. Somebody rigged Oswald's file from the beginning within the CIA, so would only go to the Office of Security. And the only guy who had access to all the files was a guy named James Angleton, okay, who, of course, is the legendary counterintelligence chief at the CIA, all right? Now, how hot was Betsy Wolf's work? It was not even transcribed in the memorandum form. It's all in handwritten notes, which I was very lucky to get from a guy named Malcolm Blunt, who's one of the consultants on the film. All right. Somehow they didn't think this was important enough to transcribe in the memoranda form. Hmm. All right. And from what I understand, Betsy Wolf doesn't like to talk about those days. I think she's an attorney in Maryland. Okay. The last time I looked. And she understandably doesn't like to talk about that. Now, having said that, that somebody obviously rigged Oswald's file from the beginning. It looks like, well, it doesn't look like it. It sure as heck looks like that Oswald's was sent to the Soviet Union, okay, to try and garner intelligence about what was going on there because there really wasn't a heck of a lot of intelligence that the CIA was getting. So they sent over this string of defectors, Oswald being one of them. Mm -hmm. All right. And it, the problem was that the KGB understood who Oswald was from the minute he stopped in Moscow. So what they did is they kicked him out of Moscow. They sent him to Minsk 400 miles away and instead of him spying on them, they spied on him. Okay, there was a whole ring of intelligence informers around Oswald, as well as there being electronic surveillance in his beautiful apartment they set him up in. All right. And so Oswald realized that 
well, I'm not making a lot of headway. <laughs> yeah. And so they brought him back to the United States. And then it looks like, and again, I think it's even stronger than that. The CIA and the FBI had anti-fair play for Cuba committees crusades going on. The Fair Play for Cuba committee was this liberal group in New York City that said that we object to what Kennedy's doing with Cuba, okay, and we believe that we should have better relations with Castro. And they had some very big names like Norman Mailer who were part of this group. And obviously the CIA and the FBI who were very anti-Castro, okay, they really didn't like the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. So they set up propaganda and infiltration campaigns against this group. David Phillips and James McCord were two CIA agents who were involved with this on the CIA side. And Carta DeLoach was one of the guys involved on the FBI side. Okay, and these are pretty high-level guys in, in those two agencies. Lee Harvey Oswald has all the earmarks of being in on this Fair Play for Cuba Committee operations to discredit the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. First of all, when he goes to New Orleans in the spring of 1963, his flyers that he makes up are stamped 544 Camp Street. Okay, which just happens to be the building where Guy Bannister and David Ferry are working out of at this time. All right. And of course, if you're supposed to believe Oswald's a communist, it's very hard to believe that he's hanging out with these extreme right wingers like this. Okay. So Guy Bannister and th their office on 544 Camp Street. Yeah, Bannister's office is at that building, and David Ferry was seen many times at that office. Okay. And, of course, David Ferry knows Oswald from his um, the Civil Air Patrol days okay. back in the 50s. Okay. So when Oswald comes into uh, New Orleans then, according to Bannister's secretary, actually two secretaries, all right, he had an office at that building. Okay, and he was making up this 544. And when Bannister heard that he had put that address on these flyers, he got livid, all right? Uh, okay, and so then, of course, Oswald gets literature from the Fair Play for Cuban Committee in New York, and they tell him, we don't think it's very smart for you to try and start a fair play for Cuba committee in the deep South in new Orleans. All right. It's not a very, let's say propitious way uh, to begin a committee. Okay. Uh, for the FPCC at this time, but he, when he goes ahead and he doesn't, he, of course, he's the only member that we know of in the whole city of new Orleans. Then he starts leafleting, in public, in the rush hour, in these streets of New Orleans. Now, I've talked to people who were in the Communist Party at that time. And they said, Jim, that's a dead giveaway sign that the guy is not a true communist. And I go, why? Because the last thing you want to do is confront somebody in public with this kind of stuff. Because it makes them stand out if they accept it and start reading it, et cetera. Okay, and all these other people are going to see them. What we did, of course, is we would go at night and we would slip the literature under the door mm -hmm. so that they, when they would come out and see it, they could take it right into their apartment, okay, and not have this stigma of being associated with this kind of thing in public. So that was a dead giveaway to me that Oswald was not really what they said he was, which was supposed to be a communist or a Marxist. So they're saying he was an agent provocateur. Right, right. And so then, of course, he does one of these on Canal Street, which, of course, is one of the busiest thoroughfares in the whole city. He does one of them outside the International Trademark, 
which where Clay Shaw works at. Okay. And this is when <clears throat> Clay Shaw's assistant, Jesse Kaur, actually called out cameras from a local TV station. And that's why we have films of Oswald doing this. He goes and he hires two people from the unemployment office <laughs> to help him, okay, in this leafleting at the International Trade Mart. Jesse Kaur, Shaw's right-hand man, had also been at the Canal Street demonstration. He saw that Oswald had put 544 Camp Street on that flyer. What does he do? From Shaw's International Trade Mart, he sends it to the FBI office and he says, note last page, which is where the address was. That's very, well, it's, it's more than interesting because it tells us that Jesse Core working for Shaw knew what was at 544 Camp Street. And he was trying to tell the FBI, okay, somehow, some way, you got to get this guy to stop doing this. All right, which dictates that the FBI was in cahoots with uh, Guy Bannister, which, of course, they were. Then this culminates, of course, with the fistfight between Carlos Bringier of the DRE, the Student Directorate National, okay, the uh, faction in New Orleans. And he gets in a fight with Oswald, and they actually go to court. All right, and bring the air who actually threw the punch. He walks off scot free. Oswald goes ahead, is guilty, and gets a ten dollar fine. He was in detention also after he was arrested. And what does he do in detention? He calls the FBI. <laughs> now I ask you, what kind of a communist? calls the FBI when he gets detained for getting in this street altercation. Very, very, very unusual. All right. And then after this is all over, he goes around to the newspapers, gets on TV, gets on the radio, starts talking about the fair play for Cuba committee. So this has all the earmarks of being a created event in well in advance. Okay. Of when it actually happened. So this is why most people believe that Oswald was not really a communist. He was really what you called it, an agent provocateur. Mm -hmm.